Good evening. This is Chairwoman Tierra Booker DeWire. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, September 24, 2024. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Ugoma Chika Kalu. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel <laughs> 73, Verizon Files Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the September 24th agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any additions or changes to this evening's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, res resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other or any, uh, where am I? or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The closed session summary and the open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, deceased recognition of service, certificated appointments, area education advisory council appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D5? So moved, Stileski. Do I have a second? Second, Chike Kalu. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chika Kalu? Yes. Ms. Dulaski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members Thank of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointment for your approval. Assistant Principal, Stemmers Run Middle School. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Lichter. Do I have a second? Second from Pong. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chikakalu? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. I'll turn it over to Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Our appointment this evening is John Mobley. Please stand and be recognized. <laughs> John Mobley Jr. is attending this evening and is being appointed as the assistant principal at Summers Run Middle School. With 20 years of experience, his prior experiences include social studies teachers at Aberdeen Middle and High School. So congratulations and welcome to BCPS. Thank you. Welcome to BCPS. We're looking forward to having you do great things for our school system. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to board members via email at boe at bcps.org. 
the Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and Office of School Safety has recommended safety and security protocols, which are posted in the boardroom and available in board docs and on the board's participation by the public website. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior such as vi language that promotes violence against a BCPS employee or that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order and will not be tolerated. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time or prior to that at the discretion of the board chair. So I will now call on our school system affiliated groups to speak and our first speaker is Ms. Ramona Basilio um, from the PTA Council of Baltimore County. Madam Chair, Superintendent Rogers, and members of the board. Um, how's everybody? I hope you will. Um, I'm going to talk real fast. Basically, I'm here to discuss follow up conversations about the cell phone policy and particularly off and away. I'm here to provide a brief report based on some of my committee members' visits to several schools. We've been to some of the pilot schools. Off and away, the pilot program is really, really catching on. This time last year when we asked members in the for a forum, about 50 people, how many knew about the cell phone policy, about three raised their hand and they were students. Um, this year, last night as a matter of fact, when we asked the question, all but four of 50 parents responded that they knew about it. So kudos, it's working, it's gaining momentum. However, there's apparently a viral tweet or something going around that several students and schools have been responding to for the past couple of weeks, few weeks. I've been asked by my board and by parents to come before you and say, this has to be a partnership with parents. For parents who are listening out there, please, the teachers are not in your homes and you are not in their classrooms. In order for this to work, we really need parents and community members to work in partnership with the school and the administrators to help facilitate off and away and responsible phone, cell phone use. One example that came up was a woman who said her child was videotaped in the, in the bathroom, the restroom, his private parts were circulated throughout the school. In the exchange between the two parents, which was amenable considering the circumstances, what, what each parent agreed to is it's a parenting thing. It's a home thing. Did we want the principals in the bathroom checking to make sure students are not videotaping? Let's see what we can do about educating students about the perils of cell phone use, not just in terms of safety, but in terms of their psyche. Why is it that they cannot put the phone away and leave it there? We need to do some work. So when some folks said, okay, well, what do we do? They look in despair. And I say, for those of you who may be around my age, although I'm not giving my age away, when you heard the expression, this is your brain, this is your brain on, don't say it out loud, <laughs> I don't want to date you, but this is your brain. It was a media campaign for 30 years. Did it solve the problem? No. But 20 years later, I still remember that, and so do many of you. Let's do what we can to support FACE, the student council, um, Stacy Wade, the social media group, and of course, Dr. Rogers and members of the staff who are working on this issue. Thank you. Next are our unions, and we have Ms. Cindy Sexton from TABCO. Good evening, and I second everything about that. That was wonderful. Thank you. I have heard from a few schools with off and away and it's making a huge difference so I'm super excited about that but I'm here tonight to talk about the calendar because it's that time of year I, I know you're going to be presented with two calendars tonight and as a member of the calendar committee with BCPS there were many concrete valid reasons given 
for starting the school year before Labor Day. The reasons shared had everything to do with our students and what they need for academic growth and successes. And I know some of those reasons are gonna be shared with you later tonight, so I won't go into the detail right now, but our students need as much instructional time as possible on the front end of the school year. With well over half of our schools now identified as community schools, we know the needs are great for our students and it is incumbent on us to do the right thing by them. We're here for our students. Every decision should be based on what is best for them. Arguments and debates about the calendar distract us from other important work that needs to be done. A pre-Labor Day start was the decision of the calendar committee. In fact, I don't even remember if anyone voted for a post-Labor Day start. If the need arises, TABCO is willing to survey our members to ask their opinion. And I know the system has done that fairly recently and TABCO has as well, but some of those post-Labor Day fans will challenge the accuracy of the data. And so if we need to do it again, we are willing. But whenever we have taken that poll, educators are overwhelmingly in favor of a pre-Labor Day start because it's what's best for our students. I'm also asking that as you look at the, counters, the calendars, version one is the option that you adopt. Our educators need those five full days of pre-service week to prepare for our students and the school year. Thank you for your consideration of that version and please let me know what you need from TABCO to help you make your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Next are our individual citizens and student groups and our first speaker is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Good evening, everyone. I have been spending a lot of time in several schools across the county, and some of the things that I am seeing are causing me concern about safety. I noted this last meeting and the meeting before, and I'm going to reiterate it because it is creating not just a safety hazard, but a danger to students with disabilities. I'm referring to the minimalization of the additional adult support in the classrooms. If I have an IEP that states that I have a dedicated, and I'm going to underline dedicated aid, that means I need a one-on-one -on -one with me at all times because I might decide to bolt from that classroom because my disability is such that I have multiple concerns and I need somebody with me at all times. And that is not happening this year in any of the schools that I have clients. And it really is dangerous. And some of the solutions that I have seen are even more dangerous. To give you an example, I visited a school for an observation and I had somebody with me who was a, st a staff member of the compliance office. And when we went to leave that classroom, there was a locking device on the door that neither of us could unlock. Can you imagine if there was a fire in the building? I don't think I have to say something about how dangerous it is, but obviously I do. The other thing that I think needs to be reiterated again is the lack of a plan in place in most schools to know what to do if a child with a disability who's not verbal all the time walks into that nurse's office. I do have students who are in that situation. Safety plans have been issued, not shared, not followed. 
what good is that piece of paper? This is something that needs to be addressed now and not when we get around to it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Risa Perlman. Okay, we'll go to Dr. Bosch Ferron. evening to all. I do apologize for my attire. I really didn't have time. All right, Dr. Lodgers, I see that you are coming to Catonsville School for communication with the family and also in Kenwood. And I really applaud you for doing that. Communication is everything, especially with students and parents, public like myself. Uh, Catonsville, as you may know, has a large Muslim population. It's really diverse. Um, Islamic Society of Baltimore uh, is a place for more than several 10,000 of Muslim residents there. And of course, their kids go to the school. And their concerns, again, about security and especially about Islamophobia in the curriculum or by some unfortunate teachers. Uh, so I respectfully ask you to really take care of that and I talked about that quite a bit. I also compliment you on coming back there and shaking hand with uh, people in the audience. And I want to say something and I know one day you shook my hands it's really more important for us, the public, that our superintendent and maybe also the board members really come and shake our hands. You know, we are the customers, we are the taxpayers. It really doesn't hurt you. I think it would be a great gesture and appreciation. Um, I want to mention one word about Dr. Hirston. Dr. Hirston was really a decent man. Honestly, I really miss him. He's, um, he's big, scary, but deep inside, he's really a very good person. He invited me twice to the mansion just to talk. And I suggest that to you, Dr. Rogers, you don't have to invite me, but use the power that you are the queen of that mansion for all what it means. If people have issues, invite them in there. Cup of coffee, chit chat, nothing really wrong with it. I, I think delaying solving things creates problems after problems. It's not really good for the system. And I tell you honestly, as a fair observant from the outside to the inside. So, um, that's my, my take today. Thank you. And I will just check one more time for Ms. Perlman. Okay. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Burns. Madam Chair, there were no actions that need to be confirmed in public. Thank you, Mr. Burns. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the board handbook, board goals, and board self-evaluation. For over a year, board members have collaboratively worked to revise the board handbook, board goals, and board evaluation. This work started under former Chair Lichter and Vice Chair Harvey, where ad hoc committees were formed, and they were led by Mr. Young and Ms. Frempong. Board members have applied their learnings from professional learning experiences on effective board practices and from our board discussions to strengthen each document. So at this time, I will turn it over to Mr. Young uh, to present an, an overall review of the revised handbook. Thank you, Ms. Booker-Dwyer. 
I want to first start by thanking the members of the committee for their hard work on um, going through and reviewing the handbook and providing that first draft to the board to review. As we've gone through the handbook, um, we have ensured that the language was revised to strengthen alignment with our current laws and policies. We've added the oath of office. We have updated the signature page and we've updated the request for information section so that it conforms with our current practices. And we have also updated the information on the board committees. Do I have a motion to approve the board handbook as presented? So move, Lichter. Do I have a second? Second, Harvey. Any discussion? Ms. Pumphrey and then Mr. McMillian. There's just a couple minor yep. um, adjustments that didn't need to be made that I've seen. Um, one is on page 21, Appendix D. The link should be actually be um, linked to Appendix A, which is the board norms. And so we'll make, that. so. Um, yeah. It's okay, Append on page 21, there's a link to Appendix D, and it should be linked to Appendix A, which is the board norms. Mr. McMillian. Uh, Mr. Young, you, you mentioned uh, the committee assignments. On uh, page 11, it's, it talks about there's a couple three a b and c are there any other references did when you referenced committees is there any more detail that i'm not i'm overlooking what page are you on again mr mcmillian it was page 11 down the bottom number three committee assignments a, B, and C. There is a section, and I'm trying to find it right now, um, where we actually, on starting on page 24, is where the board committees are listed and the updated descriptions was provided by each of the committees. Okay, and is there a starting date? Because historically, and my time on the board, we always, the new chair was elected the first meeting in December, and then up, up sometime in January, the, the new committees came out and took place. There was discussion about this happening in July 1st, mm -hmm. and I don't remember any discussion about that. Uh, they said that there was a consensus that we, and, and Ms. Gover was gonna look into it, I was told, but uh, so there was the discussion at a, at a board meeting to complement the continuum of the school year. And so that's why to have the committees go from July 1 to June 30th. Um, so that discussion was had a little while ago. Ms. Gover would need to go back through the meeting minutes. And so that was incorporated on page 24 uh, um, where it talks about board committees. So that's, it specifically addresses the July 1st? Yes. Gotcha. Now, would that normally take a, a, a motion from somebody on the board? You know, a consensus is a lot different than the board voting on that. I mean, we lost six months from, from actually seven months, if you look from the beginning of December, until uh, July 1st for the, the new committees to take place. I don't understand why we got away from what we did historically, and I can only speak to the six years I've been on the board. I don't know about before that. Can, well, Mr. Burns, anybody? Well, I know as a board, we, we charged ourselves to take a look at historically what has not served our students well, and we, we were committed to making the appropriate changes so that we can ensure that Student, students are improving. That is the ultimate goal. And what we have seen this year with a lot of the changes that has been made, this is the first time in over 12 years that we're starting to see the data trend upward. And so I would argue that the changes that, are, um, that have been made on this board is having a positive impact 
on the overall school system. Well, it just seems to me that we should be talking about, you know, something specific as that. You know, if you're going to change something, uh, shouldn't we all have input in on the change? Would you like to make a motion to, to change something? or Because it's in the book right now, and we're all, we haven't voted yet on the book. So anything in this book is it's open to modification, just like Ms. Pumphrey made a modification to, um, is requesting a modification to page 21. So if there's something that you feel like needs to be modified and the full board agrees, um, then you're welcome to make that motion. I'm just not going to vote for it. That's all. Okay. Mr. Young. Mr. McMillan, we did have a um, robust discussion about the start date because one of the points that um, board member Hen brought up with is she mentioned that usually around December they, the committee assignments do change based upon a new board member taking over the role as chair to ensure that they are not overloaded. So we did have that discussion about changing the date, but we decided to move forward with a July 1st start date. Ms. Lichter. Um, I don't think that we lost time. I just, you had said that we lost seven months. I think the committees continued to work even though we didn't switch to our new committees until July. So I just don't, people think we stopped the committees in those seven months. We just remained where we were. As the former board chair, it was a little daunting to get elected into the board chair and then all of a sudden have to decide who went to which um, committee. So I do understand the rationale of waiting, um, but, it, but we're not, I just want people to understand that we don't stop the committee meetings and then restart them, that it is a continuous process. Um, in regards to what I said, okay. you know, the, the, the committees were, we still different met. people were on different committees, different leadership. So that seven months to me made a difference because we were continuing, but then all of a sudden things changed. Well, they have to change at some point, whether they change in January, or they change July 1st. I mean, you, we were, we Then we went into summertime and there weren't meetings. You know, I just don't, you know, it just seems to me July 1st is a long time from the time that the, and if we go back and research it, we could probably, you know, it says that the board chair has the responsibility of coming up with the committees. Which still okay. happened because she right. still, the chair but still why, came up. Why I don't not do it right away? The seven right. months. Mm -hmm. Ms. I just okay. don't want the people to think that we stopped the work of the committees in those seven months. The work still I wasn't continued. saying that. Okay. Ms. Dominowski. I, I just wanted to reiterate, and this was brought up when we were discussing it, that the one issue we have is that board members are, you know, we get reelected every four years and we start December 1st or sometime after December. So changing the date from July 1st, you're gonna essentially break up an entire committee in the middle. So that, that I do kind of have a problem with and that will cause, pro like, mm -hmm. it, so that, uh, that's one thing I, I don't, one reason why we shouldn't change it from the July 1st to the June 30th. Any other discussion? Uh, Dr. Savoy. Where does the handbook speak to moral turpitude? And so it, so accountability for board members and um, and we do have the moral imperative, but that's more in the board's evaluation and in the uh, board goals that you'll see. Any other discussion? And, and uh, Mr. McMillian. And one thing about what Ms. Dominowski just said, you know, we're not, we're all in the same cycle. We're not staggered. So, you know, there were only a couple of us that came back this last cycle. And then Ms. I think Ms. Hen and I, and then Ms. Selusky came, uh, and, and she'd had experience before. So that, I think that's a very relevant point. You could have a, really a lot of board members, maybe even though, you know, the, the complete 12 could be, no? No, that, that wouldn't happen, uh, Mr. McMillian, so that, uh, the appointed board members are in a different cycle than the elected board members. So you actually did just happen. It all, all, all so of us. So, Ms. Dominowski, so what I am saying is that when you look at the state law, the appointed board members are in a different cycle than the elected board members. I get last year, it was the last time this had, it was a unique, it was a unique experience. Um, and so the work of the board will not stop. 
So the whole intent of the July 1st through the June 30th is to complement the continuum of the school year because this is about the students and not about the adults. So if you don't wanna vote for it, then just don't vote for it. Or if you have a motion, then make a motion to, to change it um, to something better. But this right now is all in alignment with um, the, the, the continuum of the school year. Ms. Stiletsky. Um, do we know what the other Maryland districts do in terms of their committees? Do they um, begin in July? You know, like you're suggesting with, with good reasons, and I, I can certainly see both sides. So, but it's just sort of understanding maybe what other school systems do, and um, have any other school systems changed from the uh, January to July, or from July to January? Thank you. Ms. Dominowski. I'm sorry, I just, I, I'm gonna take a little bit of an issue with, you know, this is about the students and not the adults. One of the reasons we're changing it from July 1st is because the chair has too much on her plate to make those decisions. So I don't think it's fair to say that we're not thinking of the students when we're asking about changing it, uh, keeping it the way it's been, that's all. Any other, Mr. Young. So the major reason, one of the reasons is, is for stability. We're as pointed out, you know, there will be an, an election in December. There will be new folks who come on. With, with this July time frame, you still have continuity of leadership on those committees and people who can help guide the rest of the members through. Ms. Grimbaugh. So I asked, actually wanted to speak to, um, we also have state committees, so or MAVE committees. And some of us as board members also serve on those, uh, those committees. And so their time frame is actually incongruent with, it, it is in alignment with this. So for example, if we had kept for December, we start out with one chair of a committee that may be assigned to a state committee. And then because it changes in December, it's then that person has to catch up if they're wanting to represent us as Baltimore County on that state committee. So also with this change, it can have that continuous representation for Baltimore County voices on the state committees. Thank you. Mr. McMillian. And lastly, back to the, okay. So the appointed people have a two year extension, sort of say this year. So they're gonna have six years on the board. Right. That's still, we're looking at eight people that you know, ex excluding the students, so we got seven elected and that eight. So if if they run out, and you have a completely new, a new group come in, voted in November, and they're sworn in of, of December, then you've got X number of months, where they're not, you know, those committees aren't filled. Am, am I am I looking at that wrong, Mr. Young? My expect. Go ahead, Mr. Young. My expectation is once they are, um, have taken the oath of office, that they will receive a committee assignment. It's not that that committee would, would remain vacant from the November election, December when they're sworn in until you know, July 1st. They would receive a committee assignment, but you have other folks who are, are there who have the experience to help guide them through during that time frame. Ms. Harvey. Mr. Young uh, made the point I was going to make. Thank you, Mr. Young. <laughs> okay, so we now have a motion on the floor to approve the board handbook um, with the, and, and Ms. Pumphrey, did you make a motion to? I didn't know if I needed to make a motion since it was not um, conceptual. Thing. Yeah, it was yeah. more of a, an error, okay. a typo type of error than a, anything, um, okay. any context. Okay. And so may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chica Kalu? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? No. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes, motion carries. Next, I call on Ms. Frimpong to present an overall review of the board goals. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
just want to say thank you as well to uh, my committee for all of their hard work and effort on this with the board goals as well as the board self-evaluation. Um, our committee consisted of Ms. Maggie Dominowski, Ms. Robin Harvey, Ms. Jane Lichter, and myself. Uh, we began the process uh, back in September of 2023. Uh, we had our first draft in October of 2023, and um, this is what is being presented before the board today. Um, this goals, these goals are aligned with our moral imperative, which is that all students can and will learn in safe, inclusive, and high quality teaching and learning environments, as well as policy 8120, which is the purpose, role, and responsibilities of the board. Thank you, Ms. Frempong. May I have a motion to approve the board goals? So moved, Salaski. Do I have a second? Second, yo. Any discussion? Ms. Frempong. So I did get um, some additional feedback that I wanted to um, add. So two items, um, just a revision. So under focus area one, task item one, to remove quarterly so that the section just reads as review and assess reported student academic data as a system, et cetera. And then the second item is focus area two under the metrics. Two, three, four. The fourth item to remove um, the wording use of superintendent's evaluation so that that bullet will just read as review the dissemination of information relating to schools, et cetera. So those were the two changes. I don't know if I need a motion to do that or not. Okay, so I'd like to make a motion for those two items. I second the motion, Victor. Th thank you. Um, any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rampong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chikakulu? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. And now we need a motion, right? And, um, and so now we will, um, so do I have a motion to approve the amended board goals? So move, Lichter. Do I have a second? Second, Harvey. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chikakulu? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Lastly, I call on Ms. Frempong to present an overall review of the board's self evaluation. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the same individuals, thank you again to your work. On this, we have um, created a board self-evaluation form. Um, as a board, we are a collective unit and that's where our authority is. So this was a um, l interesting one to do. Um, the self-evaluation is broken down into individual board member performance as well as board performance. And that is what you have before you. Um, we do also have options to talk about additional areas of strength, what areas we're doing well versus what areas the board can improve. And so that is what is before you and what has been submitted. Do I have a motion to approve the board's self-evaluation as presented? So moved, Stolesky. Do I have a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chikakulu? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is the report on the proposed 2025 2026 school calendar. And for that, I call on Ms. Charlie Green and Ms. Bilski. Good evening. 
Good evening, Board Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Rogers, and members of the Board. I'm here tonight with our Director of Staff Relations, Ms. Bielski, and we come before you to present recommendations from the Calendar Committee for the 25-26 school year. The Calendar Committee is a multi-stakeholder committee that is comprised of principals, office heads, representatives from each of our five employee associations, as well as members of the Board of Education, stakeholder and advisory groups. As you can imagine, crafting a calendar that maximizes teaching and learning, balances system needs, and meets state and local requirements that everyone loves is a really tall task. We are grateful for the time, consideration, and decision making that went into these recommendations. At this time, I turn it over to Ms. Bilski to share the committee recommendations. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Dr. Rogers, and members of the Board of Education. In accordance with board policy and Superintendent's Rule 6301, the superintendent is charged with convening a committee to assist in the development of a school calendar. The committee met on May 6, 2024 and May 13, 2024 to develop a calendar for the 2025-2026 school year. Tonight, I present the committee's recommendation. The 2025-26 calendar encompasses 191 teacher days, 180 elementary student days, and 181 middle and high school student days, with an additional three days built into the calendar at the end of the school year, June 12th, 15th, and 16th, as inclement weather days. As discussed at last year's September 26, 2023 board meeting, a pre-Labor Day start has a positive impact on student education. Therefore, the calendar committee only focused on pre-Labor Day start calendar options for the 2025-26 calendar. As you'll see depicted on this slide, the kindergarten readiness assessment must be um, administered prior to October 11th. The pre-Labor Day start provides kindergarten teachers an additional five days to administer this comprehensive assessment. The MCAPs, the PSAT, the SAT, and the advanced placement exams, this pre-Labor Day start provides elementary and secondary students an additional five days of instruction in preparation for various assessments that begin in the early winter and run through May. The graduation date for seniors does not change. The pre-Labor Day start provides seniors with five additional days, which they would lose with a post-Labor Day start. The pre-Labor Day start allows students to return to school one week earlier. That means working parents will not have to look for childcare when camps end, or students would not, would not be home unsupervised. Last, the student enrollment data is required to be reported to the state by September 30th. The pre-Labor Day start provides our administrative assistants five additional days to get students enrolled. If students are not enrolled by the non-negotiable September 30th deadline, there is no funding for that student. With the six school holidays that all occur during the school week in which students have off school and teachers engage in professional development, there was an imbalance in the required number of teacher days versus student days. As students were in school, a total of 180 days, the minimum requirement, and teachers were scheduled to work 192 days, which is over by one day per the TABCO master agreement. The committee was tasked with finding a way to reduce the teacher duty days by one day for the 2025-26 school year. Two options were crafted, as you see illustrated on this slide, and by majority vote, 14 to 1, the calendar committee voted for version 1. I do want to add that both versions of the school calendar, based on feedback that you provided last school year, they have half days that only entail um, grading and reporting, and um, conferences. So there are no other half days for any other reason but those two. 
I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Mr. McMillian? Uh, Ms. Bielski, can you share with us the composition of this committee? Of course. I'd be happy to. So this committee is represented by administrators, an assistant principal from Dundalk High, assistant principal from Ridgely Middle, and a principal from Cedarmere. The Various offices are represented, my office, staff relations and employee performance management, um, student data, research accountability and assessment, transportation, um, the, my administrative assistant, um, <coughs> excuse me, the executive director in the Department of Schools, one of them. The stakeholders, Central Area Advisory Committee representative, Southeast Area Advisory Committee representative, mm -hmm. Mr. Burke, who's the executive director of CASE, um, Lisa Dingle, who at this last committee represented BCABSE, um, a PTA representative and representative from our union OPE, um, president of TABCO, Ms. Sexton, um, the council coordinator, uh, principal of ESPBC. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Dominowski. Yes. Um, I. Um, to the dismay of my children, agree with starting school earlier than Labor Day. I think it is um, beneficial to most of our students. But I wanted to, I was wondering if it was ever considered or if it could even be considered, we do a staggered start for our kindergartners. Has it ever been thought of to do a staggered start for all of our students through all, through, across all grades as far as taking our students with IEPs, 504s, special considerations that need that extra time to settle in the classroom, having them start maybe a week earlier and then bringing in those without those considerations later on. So the concern there obviously is the requirements of days. So if you bring students in, you have to bring teachers in, and if some teachers are teaching earlier, then they're going to be over the number of days per contract. So in lieu of maybe summer school or adding on to that or giving, um, I, I'm just trying to look at what would be most beneficial for teachers because I kind of feel like that first week of school is just everybody trying to figure everything out to begin with. And with those kids with the 504s, the IEPs, the ones with the special needs, they really need that extra attention to get focused early on. And if they were able to get into the door a little bit earlier to get started off, I think that would help tremendously. Just something to consider if we could look at it, work it out. I'm not sure how. It just, I, th I think it's something that we should, it's worth looking into. Any other? Ms. Frimpong. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm also, as a parent, I agreed with the, with the pre Labor Day start. Um, and I always think about for, for the high school students that do fall sports, they are already coming back early as well. So. Um, that's something to, to think about as well. The hours balance that's on slide four at the bottom. And so for high school, middle school, and elementary school, they all have additional hours. So th those are the additional hours over what is the minimum state required number of hours. Is that correct, how I read that? I'm sorry, could you repeat your question? Sure, so for slide four, where it talks about hours balance and 36.75 additional hours for high school, 126.7 for middle school, 120 for elementary. Um, when I look at the other paperwork with the um, calendar on it, those are the hours that are over and above what is the minimum state requirement, correct? correct? correct. So um, I guess, are there any plans as far as, you know, uh, how those extra hours are gonna be used. Like again, like is it gonna be some additional support for those students? Could it be something to what maybe? Um, but just have we given thought to how we're using those additional hours? I think, I, let me respond. Okay, sure. Those, um, those hours, we're using them to instruct students in class. So that's more hours of math, of literacy, et cetera, um, that, that the students are engaged in. So they don't have the balance where we're in a position are typically where we've said, okay, this is 40 extra hours, let's do something with the 40 hours. It's 40 more hours of their regular A, B schedule is how we've, um, how we've used those days. But it also helps us because we need a minimum number of days and then you have the hours and it doesn't always match up. But it also helps us when you have inclement weather days and things like that, well, that will take away um, from those hours so you have a cushion already built in. But they're in full 
instruction, that calendar that we send out for the school year of the A, B days, those extra hours are already built there and you, um, for just regular days that the teachers are teaching. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I would love to see an extra thousand hours in the calendar <laughs> because we really need our kids all year round and for any elected official that is listening, if we can get rid of the day and hour requirement from state law um, and perhaps do either a day requirement or an hour requirement, um, but something that is not so limiting um, so that we can truly be innovative with our calendars and do what's best for our students in alignment with the blueprint. Um, so I, I have nothing to say about the calendar as presented now, and I'm glad to see the extra hours. And if you can find an additional thousand, I would love that. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Okay, this is the first reader of the proposed 2025-2026 school calendar. The public hearing on the calendar will be held during the next board meeting on Tuesday, October 8, 2024. During the public comment agenda item, during the public comment agenda item with the second reader and consideration of the calendar on Monday, November 4, 2024. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda setting. And we'll start with the audit committee. On September 17th, we had our first audit committee meeting of the school year. Ms. Barr and her team did a great job of providing year-end updates, audit trends, audit committee topics, and the FY 2025 reports. We are looking forward to our next audit committee meeting on October 15th at 4.30 p.m., where we will engage in robust discussion on the, on the um, focus and purpose of uh, the audit committee. Uh, next, we'll go to the Building and Contracts Committee, um, led by Mr. Young. Before I jump into building and contracts, I'm gonna take a step back and say thank you to Ms. Gover for all of her support when we were working through the board handbook. N the next building and contract committee is Monday, October 7th at 5 p.m. Thank you. Uh, curriculum committee, Ms. Lichter. Yes, our next meeting is October 17th at 430 I think I have to go back and look, but usually it's 4.30, thanks. Um, equity committee, Ms. Frimpong. The equity committee met, um, this most recent meeting was September 12th. Uh, we did have an update on the hiring efforts um, and what BCPS is doing in order to help to uh, recruit um, and um, diversify the workforce. The September 26th, equity committee meeting with the council is um, counseled because we are going to be having the community conversations and then the next equity committee meeting will be on october 10th at 4 p.m thank you for legislative and governmental relations um, our committee meeting we will start that committee in november policy review committee Ms. Pumphrey. At our September 16th meeting, we reviewed um, policy 6301 school calendar, policy 8501 superintendent evaluation, policy 8270 board committees, and policy 8280 board memberships. All four of these policies were moved forward for first reader, either as presented or with amendments for the full board. And our next PRC meeting is October 14th at 4.30. Thank you. Next is agenda items. Board members, please raise your hand to indicate if you have any items for consideration. Ms. Dominowski. I, I, it's not an agenda item, but I just wanted to remind everyone that the community conversation on school safety is this Thursday at Catonsville High School from six to seven, and I look forward to seeing everyone there. Sorry. Okay. Any other agenda item? We have plenty of time for agenda yeah, items, yeah, okay. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The next board meeting will be held on Tuesday, October 8, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a great evening. The meeting is now adjourned.